Good morning, ladies. Um, thank you for being here. That time change, you know, didn't uh, deter you or this cold weather. I am so happy to be here. My name is Melanie Brown. And I want to thank you, Kathy, for allowing me the privilege to be here. You know, I grew up going to um, Harvest Riverside. I grew up here. So this is kind of like my alma mater. And so when I get a chance to come back and to reconnect with old friends, with ladies, that, you know, when you serve the Lord together, there is a bond there that is, you know, eternal. And so when I get to see them, it's like, you know, a wonderful little mini reunion. So I'm so grateful to be here. Um, would you go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Esther? Did you love meeting Esther last week? Wasn't she beautiful? And wasn't she so gracious? It was so much fun to meet her and to, and to um, get to know her. And you're going to really want to be here next week because you're going to even get to know Esther's character even that much more next week. But, you know, as we got an opportunity to, to see who she was, were you guys just a little bit jealous of all the beauty treatments that she received? I know yesterday and again this morning, I was putting on my self-tanner, you know, on my legs, so I wouldn't have such white legs in the wintertime, and I was thinking to myself, Esther had someone to do this for her. <laughs> That's so nice, but, um, but this week we are in chapter three, and with any good story, there is an arch rival, a nemesis, um, an enemy, and we're certainly going to see that today when we look at the character of Haman. And I was, you know, as I was studying this chapter, I recognized that the crux of this story, the tipping point of chapter three, was in this refusal to bow. And it got me thinking, well, what is so important about bowing? So it, you know, kind of spurred me on to this, this quest to find out what, it, what is bowing. And so I want to just share with you a few of my insights as I've been studying this. And, and you know, in our American culture, the bow is pretty much extinct, right? We don't go around bowing to each other. But it's very much alive in Asian cultures. So if you were to go to Japan or China or to Korea, you would see the customary bow. And to bow is a sign of respect. It's acknowledgement. And I was thinking back about when my kids were in Taekwondo. And I remember them having their little white little, you know, uniforms on. And before a match, they would say, Sabu Munke, bow to the master. So they would be bowing to their teacher, the master. Um, acknowledging respect, but also that they were acknowledging that, you know, you are the authority, you are the referee. And so whatever call you make, we are going to respect, we are going to submit to. That's how they would start the match. And then they would turn to their sparring partner and they would bow to one another, again, as a sign of respect. And then I was thinking about this uh, new series on Netflix that I've been watching, it's called The Crown. And it's about the British monarchy. And all during that show, you see everybody bowing, bowing to one another. And the reason why they were bowing is because, again, a sign of respect, but also they were acknowledging position and uh, royalty. And they would bow to the sovereign, which is, you know, the, the Queen of England. And so we, I, was see, I was watching that. And then I also was reading an article, and it was saying that the bow actually got its origin from animalistic tendencies. And this is what it said. It said, have you ever had the advice where if you came face to face with a bear that you are not supposed to make eye contact? What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to get down low, bow, bow down as low as you can to the ground, into like a fetal position, because this will let the bear know that you are not a threat to it. And so there, that thought is like, that's how we got the bow. You know, we are not a threat. And so I heard of this story of these two campers that were out in the wilderness, and they came across a gigantic bear. 
And one of the friends said, oh, remember what we learned? If we ever to come across a bear, we're not supposed to make eye contact. We're supposed to bend down low. So they said, okay, that's right. So they start to bend down. And the friend looks over and sees that his other friend is putting his shoes on. And he says, why are you putting your shoes on? You can't outrun this bear. And he said, I know. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> okay, I stole that joke from Pastor Greg. He tells it much better. But in all seriousness, that bowing down, that, um, that gesture is one of you're acknowledging your lower status. It's saying you're stronger, you're weaker, and it's a sign of submission. And then I read that there were different degrees of bowing. The deeper the bow, the deeper the respect and gratitude. And they were saying that when you lie prostrate, that is, you're laying flat on the ground, your face to the ground. This is the ultimate physical expression of submission. You can't get any lower. You're on your face. And we see that in the Bible. We see the psalmist getting on his face before the Lord, whether it be in repentance or whether it be in worship, but you lay prostrate. And then there is the position where you kneel with your knees to the ground and a bowed head. And then over time, it evolved into the bend at the waist and the bend of the, of the head. And it wasn't until the 17th century that there was a distinction between the way men bowed, men would bow from the waist, and then women would curtsy. That's when that came into play. And so, you know, as I was studying the importance of the bow, bow and how it originated, there was a song that's actually a psalm that kept ringing through my, you know, my head. And maybe, may, maybe you know it. It's, it's Psalm 95, 6. And it says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Don't you love that psalmist tender call to corporate worship? Come, he's inviting everyone, come. Let's go bow before our king, our king who's the good shepherd, who feeds us and guides us and leads us and protects us. And I was thinking about virtue. I was thinking about that's what we do on Thursday mornings here. It's a call to corporate worship. Let's all bow in submission to our Lord, the authority of his word. That's why we're here this morning, right ladies? And then I'm also reminded of Philippians 2:10 that says that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's coming a day when it will be a mandate and everybody will bow in authority and in recognition of who Jesus Christ is. But we come today willingly, don't we ladies? We willingly bow before the Lord. The title of my message is When to Bow, and when to stand. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for drawing us to this place this morning because we believe, Lord, that where two or more are gathered together in your name, you are there in the midst. And so, Lord, we welcome your presence among us and we ask that your Holy Spirit would move among us now. And Lord, even though we might be sitting in pews, Lord, the posture of our heart is bowed before you in submission. And Lord, we're yielded to what the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us personally today. So Lord, may we have ears to hear and may we have a heart willing to apply what you're going to show us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Esther chapter 3 verse 1 starts like this. After these things. Now this phrase is there for two reasons. After these things, it's letting you know that time has passed. After these things. But that it's also telling you that something happened that we need to remember. So if we go back to the end of Esther chapter two, do you remember that incident that takes place at the very end? 
Mordecai, who we know is Esther's cousin, but really is more like Esther's surrogate father, right? He's um, by the palace wall, and he just so happens to hear two of the king's doormen proposing or plotting the assassination of the king. And he hears this, and then he goes and he reports it to Esther, who then in turn reports it to the king. So in essence, he, he saves the king's life. He thwarts that, uh, that assassination attempt. And you would think that after this honorable deed that Mordecai did, that he would have been then promoted somehow, right? He saved the king's life. But that's not what we read. When we begin to read Esther chapter 3, we read that Haman, we're going to learn more about him later, Haman, who is, um, you know, not honorable at all, he's the one who's been given this place of honor and authority. And so this is not what we expect to read. It doesn't seem fair. But you know what, ladies? This is reality sometimes, right? After you do a good deed, shouldn't you be instantly rewarded? And yet, much of our efforts and our honorable deeds go unnoticed and go unrewarded. And after you raise your children with Christian values and you take them to Sunday school, shouldn't your teenagers follow the Lord? And yet, we have prodigals. And after you take your vitamins and you exercise and you eat your vegetables, shouldn't you have perfect health? And yet we all get sick and there's disease. After you commit your life to Christ and you're here part of the Virtue Women's Bible Study and you're doing your lessons and you're having your quiet time and you're praying and you're in fellowship, shouldn't you enjoy a trouble-free life? And yet we all have our struggles and our trials. And you know why that is, right, ladies? We live in a fallen world that's tainted by sin. But we can take heart And we can have hope when things don't appear to be working out as we thought that they should. Because we have a God who is sovereign. Our God is the king of kings. He is is in control of all things. He is transcendent. That means he is above all things. He reigns supreme. He He is a God who knows all things. He sees all things. Nothing escapes his notice, his eyes are everywhere. He's omniscient, he's omnipresent. And we also know that he's a perfect record keeper, don't we? If we learn nothing else from Nehemiah, we know because of those lists that we read, those names, God knows who belongs to him. He knows us by name. He knows who's serving him. He knows who's about his business. Do you know that today that the Lord knows? Whatever it is that you're going through this morning, he knows. He knows the offenses, the injustice, the pain, the betrayal, the despair, the grief and sorrow, the disappointment, the the discouragement, the confusion, whatever state you're in, God knows. And may the fact that he knows give you comfort. He knows. But not only does he know, ladies, but he has the power and authority to use those very things, to use those things that make you cry at night, to to use those things that you feel so broken over. He uses those things for his purposes in his perfect time. You know, he can change our circumstances because he's God. Nothing is too hard for him. But oftentimes, he chooses not to change the circumstances, but to change us in the circumstances. And you know, we sang it this morning. It's a promise that we need to stand on because it's the truth of God's word. In Romans 8, 28, we are told that all things, all things work together for good. 
to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purposes. We stand on that today by faith with spiritual eyes. Although we can't see it, God is working. He's a providential God with eyes of faith, not eyes of flesh. Eyes of flesh are looking for evidence. God, what are you doing about this? I've been praying about this. Eyes of faith say, Lord, I trust that you see this and you are going to work in your time. You know, I wonder when we read about Mordecai, if he ever thought to himself, wow, why did I do that honorable good deed and save the king's life? I mean, what good did it do me? He's a pagan king who's arrogant, impetuous. He lacks wisdom and discernment. I mean, just look at the advisors that he has around him, the company that he keeps. See, Mordecai had no way of knowing that in five years from now, that the king was going to have a sleepless night of insomnia. And he was just going to happen to open up those king's chronicles. And he was going to read of that good deed that Mordecai had performed. And he was going to plan to reward him. He had no idea that that was going to happen. He was just seeing his present circumstances. And he might have been questioning them. I read a poem by Mother Teresa. It's called Do It Anyway. And I'll just read you one line. It says, the good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do it anyway. But we know Colossians 3, 23 and 24 that says, whatever you do, do it with all your heart as though you were serving the Lord and not men, knowing that it's from the Lord that you will receive, that you will receive a reward. Christ is the real master, the true king that you serve. And maybe some of you need to be reminded of Galatians 6, 9, that says, don't grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So keep trusting him. Keep doing that good and honorable and right thing because the Lord sees, he knows. Let's read in Esther chapter three, we're gonna read verses one through six together. And I've labeled this, portion, know your identity. So if you're a note taker, you can write that down. Know your identity because it's who you are that determines when to bow and when to stand. Who you are determines when you're going to bow and when you're going to stand. So let's read. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed, and they paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were with the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. So can you picture the scene, ladies? Can you picture this? This is Haman. He is second in command. He's like the prime minister. And he is the king's, you know, right-hand man. And it says that Haman was a descendant of Agag, the king of the Amalekites. See, the Amalekites were always warring against the Israelites. And five times in the book of Esther, Haman is described, or his identity is, um, he's named the enemy of the Jews. And if we look back through the Old Testament, we can trace their battles. In Deuteronomy 25, 17, the Lord is speaking and he says, never forget what the Amalekites did to you as you came out of Egypt. Do you remember when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of, out of bondage, out of the land of Egypt? They were all leaving and it says that the Amalekites came and attacked the stragglers. Now, who do you think the stragglers were that they attacked? Wouldn't it be the elderly, the old, the sick, the weak, and perhaps the children? 
they attacked them ruthlessly. And in that same verse, it says the motive why. Because they did not fear God. They didn't fear God. They hated God. And so they made themselves an enemy of God. And God says, I want you to remember what they did. Because you must destroy the Amalekites and erase their memory. So Mordecai knew that Haman was an Amalekite, God's enemy, therefore making him his enemy. And Mordecai also knew that if it was God's enemy, then if God hates and God says this is wrong, this is bad, Mordecai was on God's side. He was going to obey God. And so that's what we see there. And in verse 2, we see that everyone, all the king's uh, royal officials and everyone who, who was in the palace, they all bowed down to Haman. And that word bowed in um, the Greek, it's kahora. It means to bend the knee in a gesture of respect. And they paid homage. And that word homage is a different word. And it means to bow down as in to worship or to revere. So they were bowing down to Haman like he was, like in worship, like he was a god, like he was an idol to them. And all the king's servants bowed except Mordecai. And they asked him repeatedly, did you see that in, in your reading? Daily, day after day, they asked him, can you imagine the peer pressure that, that Mordecai was under? Why aren't you bowing? We're all bowing. Why aren't you bowing? And then Mordecai reveals the reason why he doesn't bow. What does he say? It's because he's a Jew. Mordecai is a Jew. That one phrase is pregnant with meaning. What does it mean to be a Jew? How does that distinction, you know how we were talking about your identity? That was, that was Mordecai's identity. He was a Jew. Uh, when the Bible talks about a Jew, they, um, in Deuteronomy 7, 6, it describes the Jews or the children of Israel or the Hebrew nation. All those terms, all um, those identifications, they're synonymous, okay? So when it talks about the Jew, it says, um, this is what God says in Deuteronomy 7, 6. He says about them, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Did you hear that? God is saying of the Jewish nation, of the Hebrew nation, you are holy. Holy means you are set apart. You've been set apart for me. You've been chosen. You've been selected. God chose them. They were a special treasure. That means that they were valuable. They were costly to the Lord. Now, can you just imagine if you were a Jew? Like, oh my goodness, look how special I am. And just about when you were getting really puffed up about your status, verse 7 comes and it says, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you. So in other words, he's saying, I didn't choose you because you were special. You're special because I chose you. Do you see that connection? It's only as we are connected to the Lord that makes us special. And that's what made the Jews special is because God was their God. And we see that Old Testament principle repeated in the New Testament for those who are in Christ. Because 1 Peter 2.9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Ladies, we are to be set apart. We have been chosen. We are that special treasure as well. You know, in a certain extent, when the Jews were identifying who their God was, they identified him as a personal God. Because God said, you are my people and I am your God. He, they saw God as accessible because God told them, call to me, seek me, follow me. And they admitted that they, were, that they were pretty special. They said in Deuteronomy 4, 7, what great nation is there that has a God like ours that we can just, for whatever reason, call upon him? And they also saw that God had a standard of living for them. He had a, a law that they were to keep and statutes that they were to obey. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, how much better 
Is it for us today who live under that new covenant? Because of Jesus, we don't just have God with us, but we have God in us, living within us. Jesus come and take, taking residence in our hearts through the, um, through the Holy Spirit. We can have that personal relationship with God. How awesome is that? We need to recognize that. So we see here that Mordecai didn't bow. He couldn't bow. It would have been a violation of the second commandment where God said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not bow down or serve them. And you know what else, ladies? He was taking a literal stand, a literal stand. He was standing up because to bow down would be to concede Haman's authority over him. To bow down would have meant to concede the enemy's authority over him, and he would not bow. I read this quote that said, while the king of the land may have commanded all to bow down to Haman, the king of the universe commanded all to bow down to no one but him. And that stands for us today, ladies. Same principle for us. And, you know, reading this story caused me to examine my own life. And I had to search my heart and ask God to search my heart. Lord, do I have any idols in my life that I'm bowing down to? You know, an idol is anything that exalts itself above Christ. It could be any person, passion, or pursuit that takes that first place, that rightful place where only God belongs See, we need to have God as supreme in our lives, and there should be no rival throne that exists within our hearts. Because, ladies, we can make idols about, uh, you know, we can make idols out of just about anything. The food we eat or don't eat, is that what we're thinking about all the time? The exercise we do or don't do, are we consumed by body image? and outward appearances? The relationships that we pursue, are we striving to please man and the, and the opinions of others rather than God? I just gave you my little list of the things that I need to be careful about. Those of you who know me or maybe who follow me on Instagram know that the only things really I post are things about the Lord, my family, and exercise because I really like to exercise. And there's this um, store, you, I'm sure you have one out here in Riverside too, but um, it's Lululemon. They sell, you know, athletic wear. And I was in there last week and they're running this huge campaign and there's no way that you can miss it because the posters are before you even step in the store. And then once you get in there, the propaganda is everywhere you look and they will send you home with this. It's a, it's a poem. It's a, it's their, like their statement. And I read it and it kind of frightened me. And I just want to read you a few of the lines, um, from that. And it says, it's called, it's the, it's the I Am Enough campaign, okay? And it's, and it's telling us, we rock, we raise and nurture, we teach, we lead, and we conquer. We are part creator and warrior. I am powerful beyond measure. I am enough. I read that, and I'm like, What? Because ladies, I know that I am not enough. I know how weak I am, but I also know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But I know that in my flesh, no good thing dwells. I know how weak I am. And here, you know, I think it's just the atmosphere that we're living in where we just want to make ourselves, you know, gods. We can do that. We can just say, we don't need God. We're what? The creator? Are you kidding me? We're so strong we can do all things. Are you kidding me? You know? But this, this really is our, this is, this is the culture that we're living in, that we all want to be empowered. We need to know who is in power, right? We have a king that we bow to. Amen. I have another confession to make. I might as well, right? Um, <laughs> This, this chapter forced you to really examine yourself, but I did a 48-hour fast on social media. And you know what, ladies? It was harder than I thought it was going to be. And I recognized 
how much time and energy and thought that I put into it. And I was convicted because I'm an overthinker. I mean, that's just kind of who I am. And so if I have to overthink every, every word I post, every word I say, I go, Lord, help, forgive me. Do I overthink your word? Because that's the thing we should be overthinking, right? And meditating on. And so the Lord was showing me, just Melanie, just be careful. And I want to heed that, um, that warning from the Lord. My husband was telling me about... Um, a phenomenon called the Blackberry Prayer. Have you ever heard of it? It was the the phrase was coined long ago, and I didn't really believe him, so I Googled it. And he's he's right. It's actually in the Urban Dictionary. And what it is is, you know, Blackberry was the first company that came out with a smartphone, so they were the first phones that had um, a keyboard on it. And so when people would text, they would have to hold their thumbs together like this, and they would be texting, and then their their heads would be bowed. So what does it look like I'm doing? <laughs> Looks like I'm praying, right? And they said that, you know, if people, businessmen were doing that at lunch, that waitresses wouldn't come by because they didn't want to interrupt them because they thought they were praying. And I was thinking, gosh, how many times are we like this on our phones? And it's like, oh, Lord, I hope that I'm communicating with you and talking with you as much as I am bowed like this. So it's just something for us to be careful about. I think this is a warning that maybe we didn't need 10 years ago, but I think we all certainly need to maybe just heed it today in this day and age and the time that we're living. I want to ask you two questions. And even as I wrote these questions down, I was thinking, ooh, wow, this could be a whole teaching within itself. But I think it's worth you pondering. Okay, these are the two questions. What is your identity? What is your identity? And who is your authority? Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. These are questions that we need to answer as women today. Okay, we need, to, we need to settle this. We need to know how to answer this. But these are questions that I'm asking my teenagers, my young adults that are living right now, you know, being bombarded, you know, by everything of this world. And I'm saying, what is your identity? Who is your authority? We need to be able to answer these questions. I believe that Mordecai knew his identity as a Jew in a very pluralistic society. Do we? Do we know our identity? Because we're living in an atmosphere of pluralism and diversity where all kinds of beliefs, ideas, and religions exist, and they're all put on the same level. But ladies, we need, we need to know as Christian women, we must know our identity, and our identity must be in Christ. It must be in Christ. Let me explain. Oh, you guys are so responsive. I love, love you. Um, what I mean being in Christ, see, you're either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. And what it means to be in Christ is you've made the decision to bow your knee in submission to Jesus Christ, that he is your Lord and your Savior. He is going to lead you. He is going to say what's right or wrong. And you are going to follow his statutes. You're going to follow him. And if you do that, then you know that you are in Christ. If you're outside of Christ, you're saying, no, no, Jesus. I want to do things my way. I am not going to submit to you. And you know, ladies, the lines are being drawn. And you want to make sure that you are with Christ and you're standing in Christ. Because, you know, there's no other way. You're either with him or you're without him. But when we are in him, we are who he says we are. So if you want to know your identity, if your identity is in Christ, then he tells us what our identity is. We are who he says we are. And this is what he says we are. And this is just one uh, section of scripture, you know, the whole Bible is a love letter to us telling us, you know, who we are in Jesus and all the wonderful things and benefits. But just from Ephesians 1, this is what he says we are when we're in him, when we're in Christ. We are blessed. We are beloved. We're accepted. We're adopted. We're chosen. We're forgiven. We're redeemed. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's who we are. That's our identity in Christ. And that doesn't change. And who is your authority? Who do you submit to? Who has the power and influence over your life and the choices that you make? 
shouldn't it be in the one who loves you the most? The one who is willing to shed his blood on the cross for you? We must be careful that we're not submitting to the world. And ladies, the Bible makes it very clear. When the Bible talks about the world, it's making a distinction of those who have rejected Christ. That's the world. The world is going their own way. And the Bible tells us, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And that's Romans 12 too. So we don't want to submit to the world or the world's way of thinking because the world's way of thinking is not God's way of thinking. So we're not looking to the world to know how we should live and who our identity is and what our, who our authority is. We're not looking to them. And we're not going to bow in fear. We're not going to submit to fear. Wouldn't the enemy love to have us all cower in fear and keep us from what God, the calling God has on our life, the purpose that he has for us to fulfill? You know, we're not going to submit to fear. We're going to stand with the Lord. We're not going to submit or bow down to peer pressure, political correctness, or even our own bad habits. We don't submit or give authority to anything or anyone who is in direct opposition to God's word, to God's principles, and to God's statutes. You know, in these final verses of verses 7 through 15, we see that Mordecai's refusal to bow brought severe consequences. It was costly. Not only did Haman want to kill him as a result, but he sought the annihilation of all the Jews. Haman consulted with his Persian astrologers to pick that lucky day, that's what it meant to cast Pur, to, meant to pick that day where he was going to plan his attack. He used false accusations, he schemed, he lied, he bribed, and he deceived the king into issuing a decree that was literally a death warrant on every Jew, both men and women, young and old. And then the couriers went out, motivated by greed, giving directions to plunder their victims' possessions. And doesn't this sound exactly like the enemy that we have today that we read about in John 10.10, that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy? See, his tactics have not changed. And then in verse 14, it says, a copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. Ladies, we need to be ready. We live in a day when our enemy, the devil, is threatening us. His agenda is the same, to thwart the good plans and purposes of God. And he would love it if we would cower in fear when we're supposed to be standing in faith. And he would love us to be standing in our pride when we should be bowed before the Lord in submission and in obedience and in worship. We need to know his tactics so that we know how to stand. Make no mistake about it. This genocide attempt by Haman was originated by the devil himself because the devil knew God's plan from the beginning, that it was going to be through the lineage of the Jews that the Messiah was going to come forth. And he thought, if I could just annihilate them, then he would thwart Jesus coming. But we know that that didn't happen, right? Jesus did come. He did come. And now that the Messiah has come, the enemy still fights us today to keep us from our purpose. Our purpose is to know, to love, to serve, to share, to trust, to obey, and to worship the Lord. He'll do anything to keep us from that. You know, in closing, ladies, I want to just leave you with an exhortation found in Ephesians 6.10. It's an, it's, a, it's an exhortation to stand. Brethren, but I'm going to say sisters, sisters, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having, all, having done all to stand. Ladies, there's a difference between standing and withstanding. When you stand, 
This is, the, this is the stance you take. But to withstand is to be able to still be standing when the opposition comes. So when the opposition comes, we still need to be able to withstand that. And that's the exhortation. You know, my husband is a wrestler. And he wanted me to tell you that he's a champion wrestler. <laughs> He really was. He's, he's wrestled for years, but now he actually coaches at our local high school. And those of you who have kids in sports, you know the difference between a Christian coach and a non-Christian, right? And, and this has become Bob's ministry. I mean, he prays with these kids, and, and, he, and he loves to be there and to train them. And he was telling me that the first day of every season, you know what he teaches those kids to do? He teaches them to stand because that is foundational. It's fundamental. They need to learn their stance because they can't be effective in defense or offense if they don't know how to stand correctly. The stance is the most important. We need to know how to stand, ladies, and we need to know who we're standing on. We're standing on that solid rock of Jesus Christ, that rock that does not change, that does not falter. If we're standing on, on sand, that's going to shift. If we're looking to the culture that changes every few years, we're going to topple over. We need to be standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ on his timeless truths, on his absolutes, and on his promises so that we can then withstand. So when the opposition and the pressure comes, we won't waver and we won't fall. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we just bow in your presence now because you are so good. You are so worthy of our praises, God. We bow in appreciation. We, we bow in worship. And Lord, we bow in repentance because your word confronts us. And Lord, we just pray that you would search our hearts, that you would help us, Lord, to stand when we need to, but we would submit and we would give up those things that would hinder our walk with you, Lord. We yield to you. And Lord, we also, Lord, I recognize that some of my sisters are here because they're bowed in brokenness. They're bowed in despair, and they are desperate for you, God. And I pray that you would see the posture of their heart, Lord, that you would see their neediness, God, and that you would come in those places, God, and that you would strengthen them, Lord, that you would help our feeble knees, our wobbly, fearful knees to be strong and to be able to stand in you and to be able to walk in obedience, Lord, for the things that you've called us to, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.